All right, Mohammed Al Balushi from Ireland. Okay, we play e4 as you guys know, e4 e5, and we continue playing the four knight scotch, which is our opening in the speed run. Knight f3. I assume knight c6 happens. By the way, another good thing about the four knight scotch is that you don't have to learn a separate line against the Petrov. You can just play knight c3. So it, it saves you some work. Not that the Petrov is popular. Holmes, thank you for the five. Okay, d6. Well, that's sort of, one could say, a, a souped-up Philidor. It doesn't particularly change our reaction. I mean, d4 is still a perfectly good move here. Uh, in fact, d6 is actually quite passive, so why not, you know? Why not? He takes d4, knight takes d4. And we have an advantage. I mean, this... This is a very common way of playing at this level, right? Black just trades everything on d4, but our queen is very well placed here. And that's what's important to understand is that c5 is not a, is, it is not a threat. If black plays c5, he only weakens uh, his position even further. Like the d6 pawn becomes a huge weakness, and then the d5 square becomes a potential outpost for, for one of our pieces, probably the knight. So don't be afraid, as I, always, as I like to say, of your queen being attacked. Your queen being attacked is not inherently dangerous. It can be in certain situations, but it isn't always. How should we continue developing? Where should we position our bishops? Yeah, so bishop g5, I think, is natural and strong. And since we've already gotten our queen out of d1, it makes sense to castle queenside here. In the, principled, the principled path here is to castle queenside. And then... To steamroll black on the king side and in the center. Thank you, champ, for the five subs. My goodness. It's not any. And there's c5. There's c5. It's a very, very common move at this level. Um, sort of falling in love with the idea of attacking the queen. Now, here it's important not to rush into a particular move. It's, it's quite an important decision. Uh, the question of where to put the queen. And... That question already contains the seeds of a mistake because the best move is, believe it or not, not with a queen. The best move is not with a queen. Am I suggesting we sacrifice the queen? No, I am not. What am I, what am I suggesting? Yeah, I'm suggesting that we deliver a bishop check on b5. Now, what is that likely to lead to and why are we doing that? Well, after bishop b5 check, black is likely to cover it with his bishop, right? Bishop d7. Then we trade bishops on d7, and who can tell me why the trade of light squared bishops is good for white from a positional standpoint? I'm talking positionally. I'm not talking about tactics right now. From the standpoint of, of what I just explained, our main advantages are, yes, so d5 becomes even weaker. Imagine black's bishop sits on e6, and it somehow controls d5. Somewhat controls d5. If the light squared bishops are gone then really there's nothing that can control d5, and we can always capture this knight when we want to and slam that knight into d5. So we we have to be a little bit careful here, actually. The funny thing is, <laughs> if we take on d7 immediately, there's, believe it or not, the move knight takes d7. This reminds me of a famous trap. And that leads us to an endgame that we have to properly evaluate. So bishop takes d7, knight takes d7. Now, in that position, if we take the pawn on g7, that would be a terrible blunder because bishop takes g5 is check. So after bishop takes d7, knight takes d7, we have to play bishop takes c7. Black takes our queen. We take black's queen. Black's pawn takes our knight. Then our bishop on d8 is hanging. It has to drop back to h4. And in that resulting endgame, white is much better and I don't know if you guys are, are visualizing that position or not, but essentially the pawn on d6 in that resulting endgame is going to be lost. It's it's toast. But that's an important line to calculate. I don't know if that made sense. It was a mood point. Queen takes d7 happened as I thought it would. Now we have to figure out a good square for the queen. So we need a square where the queen is simultaneously active, but it's not in the way of other pieces. So, for example, on e3, I think it would be in the way of other pieces. It would walk into knight g4. On d3, it would be in the way of the rook. I want the rook on d1 to exert an x-ray against the queen. So I want to get the queen off of the d-file, but not on e3. Well, that only leaves us with one square. I really like the c4 square. It's, it's putting pressure on black's position. b5 is not dangerous because we're defending that square twice. And you might 
contemplate the question of why I why I was so keen on establishing the X-ray. Well, what move does this does that allow us to play now? That allows us to play a very very powerful move. Yeah, the move e5 is kind of a no brainer here. It just forces the knight back, and Black's position starts to doesn't start to collapse. Black's position simply is on the verge of collapsing here. And it all happened because he's played the move c5, which greatly weakened Black's center. It weakened the d6 pawn, it weakened the square. Uh, and, and positionally speaking, that's almost a decisive mistake. Black has to be very, very careful here not to lose. I'm sort of expecting the move knight g4, and that does lose the game. It loses a piece to bishop takes e7, but, you know, players often struggle to, to figure out the right approach in a position like this. Uh, this is a Philidor by transposition. Yeah, 98 is correct, but 98 will end up losing a pawn, and not only will it end up losing a pawn, but Black's position will also suck in that resulting position. So h6 here doesn't work. If, if Black plays h6, then we can still take the knight with our pawn, and we are simultaneously attacking the bishop. That doesn't work. Uh, d5 also doesn't work because we can ignore everything and take the knight with our pawn. That is why we established the x-ray against the d-pawn precisely for that reason. So d5, e takes f6, and if black takes our queen, then we take black's queen and we're up, a, we're up a piece because we took a knight and black didn't take any of our minors. Knight e8, good stuff by our opponent. Now there's a couple of approaches in this position. We're going to take the very simple approach of releasing the tension and winning a pawn. How do we do that? What am I talking about? Uh, I'll show you after the game another interesting way to play this position. But we're not going to over, over, overthink it or overdo it here. We're going to take the bishop. We're going to take the pawn. And then the c5 pawn, and that's pretty symbolic that the c5 pawn that was weakened uh, ultimately falls. And it falls with a pin. So black not only loses a pawn, but look at how flimsy black's position is as a result. Our rook is coming into e1. Our knight is coming into d5. So we have tremendous potential energy among our pieces. So black is down a pawn and his position is terrible. It's not just the material loss. Black must be extremely cautious not to lose more material. Rook fd8, good move. No, rook c8 doesn't help, Kavita. Rook c8, we, we can take the knight with our queen because the rook is also guarding that spot. Okay, so what should we do? Well, um, we can try to win the game we can try to win the game immediately with the move knight b5, going after the knight. Uh, but as it turns out, knight b5 is not successful. He, th it might work in this game, but who sees the... Oh yeah, we're going to play rook h1. We're going to play the natural move. But before we do that, who can tell me why knight b5 is unsuccessful? It's not an easy move, by the way. Yeah, knight b5, rook a to c8. And if the queen drops back along the diagonal, the black has the sudden queen g5 check, forking the knight and, uh, and the king. And that's why king b1 in such situations is a very good move to throw in. But in this case, we're just going to go rook h1, bring the rook into the game. And if the queen drops back to f8, I'm thinking it's not a bad idea to just go king b1, just so we don't have to ever worry about tactics related to the king sticking out on c1 ever again. The alternative is to go knight d5 and continue improving our pieces. In fact, I like knight d5 a little bit more. Let's just, let's just go knight d5. Let's not worry about king b1 yet. Because now that the queen has dropped back to f8, we don't truly have to worry about our king being on c1, right? I'm hoping for rook a c8 because we have a very, very nice idea if rook a c8 happens. But I think it will happen. It's a very natural move. Now, what is white threatening here? Well... Of course, we are building our play based on piece activity. We're also playing against the knight on d6, which is a tremendously flimsy piece. We're threatening the move knight e7 check, which slices off the queen's connection to the knight. And then we will be able to take the knight with our with our rook. That's partially... We didn't play rook e1 only for that reason. It just gets the rook to an open file. And those are the best moves. If you can make a move that simultaneously creates a threat, but it also... Uh, but it also improves, let's say, the position of a piece. That's the ideal world. B6 is a great move. Our opponent is playing well. Where should we move our queen? So we cannot play knight e7 check. That would be a blunder. That would be a blunder due to queen takes e7. 
And remember that in that resulting position, our queen is also hanging, it would blunder a piece. We have to speed up just a little bit. The best approach in such positions, as Yasser would say, is to keep the queen as a supporting actress, to not over-involve the queen, and to keep it on a square where it operates from a distance, but it doesn't compromise its effectiveness. And that's ultimately why queens and bishops are so good, right? The queen on a3 is doing exactly the same work that it was doing from c5. But now it's no longer vulnerable to moves like b6 and rook c8. Does that make sense? So now we don't have to worry about the queen getting caught up. Rook d7, a great move. Now I think we should continue building our play against the knight on d6. And we should do that by doubling rooks on the d-file. Let's, let's play the move rook d3. And this move carries a couple of purposes. We could lift the rook to g3 and create threats like knight f6. But we're also preparing to double rooks on d1. And ultimately, we're trying to get the knight to move so that we can trade queens and get into a pawn-up endgame. This I, probably is our first game that's really not, you know, not straightforward, not a straightforward win. Our opponent is defending very, very well. Why not queen before? That was an alternative. The only reason I put my queen on a3 rather than before is because on a3, it's, and just as I say that, of course, a huge blunder, as always, uh, the queen here is protected by a pawn. That is literally the only reason I put it on a3 and not on b4. Yeah, I mean, g6, inexplicable move, knight f6 check. And I guess it is explicable. Just the fact that black is under so much pressure for so long, it, it causes irrational moves like that one. And that blunders the rook. And also black loses, the, okay, I guess he doesn't lose the knight, but he does lose the rook. <laughs> and guess what? It would have been nice if we had played king b1. Queen h6 wouldn't have been possible. Okay, and now where should the queen go? Well, our queen is attacked. As soon as g6 is played, you should be paying the most attention to the long diagonal. Obviously, the queen goes to c3 and picks off the knight. Easy, easy as cake. Okay, knight e5. I mean, this is just desperation. Um, if you want to play... If you want to play in a classy fashion... Probably taking with a knight is the best to set up a discovered check. Uh, but we can take with anything we want. It, it really doesn't matter. Right, let's just take with a queen. Let's just take with a queen with check. It, it, it doesn't matter. And our opponent is disconnected. And resigned. Good. Good stuff. Okay. Well, uh, e4, e5. Yeah, so, so d6 is a strange move that is unnecessary. I mean, knight f6, of course, is is the main move. Uh, we, we decided on d4. And I, I guess it would make sense for black here to play the move bishop g4. That would seem to be the consecutive approach. e takes d4 and knight takes d4 is just incredibly passive. This bishop is bad. Our pieces are nicely placed in the center. And so, you know, black's position is already very iffy. And the move c5, I would go so far as to say that it's almost a decisive mistake. And I hope that I was able to explain fully why this move is so bad. It creates all of these long-term weaknesses, and it doesn't have anything going for it. Literally, the only virtue of this move is that it attacks the queen, and that's not inherently a good thing. And this is something I'm, I'm really trying to hammer into, into your head. You should never make a move just because it threatens a piece. Unless you're losing and you're trying to set a trap and you're hoping for a blunder. Uh, first of all, you shouldn't play in a way where you hope for blunders. Threats can be good, but they can't be good just because they're threats. They, they have to do something else. Like the threat has to be unstoppable or it has to be part of a larger plan. And this should be five check is just a good example of not reacting automatically, but really searching for the maximum. And of course, as long as your, your opponent's king is uncastled, you should always be aware of checks along this diagonal. You should just keep an eye out for, for moves like bishop b5 and queen a4 and stuff like that. Yeah, black should, black should castle here. Black should castle and black's position is okay. I mean, we probably would have put this bishop on d3 where it potentially aims at the king after e5. And black is worse. I mean, no question about it. We can bring the pawn up to f4. Black's position is very cramped here, but it's not structurally unsound. Black's position is still structurally sound. Um, so hopefully this move makes sense. Now, here's the hilarious thing. Th this idea of going knight takes d7 and exposing an attack against the bishop is a very well-known trap in another line. 
there's a very well-known trap uh, and even uh, strong grandmasters have fallen into this trap throughout history. And it has very similar contours. And I'll show you guys the most famous example where Tigran Petrosian defeated a Dutch grandmaster named Hans Rie in eight moves in a very important game in the Olymp in the Wekanze, actually, in what was then known as Hohebeins, but now is Tata Steel, 1971. Okay, so English, c4, e5, knight c3, knight f6, knight f3, knight c6, g3, it's a symmetrical English, right? I mean, how is it possible that this game lasts only four more moves? Well, bishop b4, knight d5, this is a, a viable... Oh, no, 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 this is the wrong game, sorry. This is also a very cool game. I confused, this is a different game. Uh, but I'll show you guys this one as well. This is a really cool trap too. But I, I confused this with, with something else. Um... So C takes D5, and here, thank you, Shy King, Hans Re, I'll, I'll find the other game as well, don't worry. Hans Re goes E4, counterattacking White's Knight. The funny thing is after D, C, E, F, and this is a good illustration of, you know, the importance of undefended pieces and, and how damaging it can be to have a single undefended piece on the board. After White's next move, Black resigned, and then I'll find the other game. After Black's ne after White's next move, Black resigned. Yeah, the move is Queen B3. Well, what's so great about this move? Well, the bishop has to move. If Black defends it, White can simply attack it. One way or another, the bishop is going to have to move, but it can't move because if it moves, then you give up B7 with the fork. It's just nothing that Black can do. I mean, Black can play F takes C2, but White's just going to recapture. That doesn't change anything. Yeah, Wayne B3 wins the game. So that, that's a cool one. Right. So this is a pretty strong game. White was a guy named Dorishkevich. Dorishkevich was an international master, very competent Russian player. Um, Black was Tukmakov, who is still alive, and he's a very strong GM. So watch what happens. This is also in English. That's why I confused it. Um, this time, Black goes F5, D4, E4. And do you guys see why? I mean, it's a similar kind of position because after bishop g5 knight f6 again white goes with this d5 move e takes f3 d takes c6 f takes g2 already white is in trouble white has to play bishop takes g2 and give up the pawn but as you can understand white plays c takes d7 check and thought okay bishop takes d7 bishop takes g2 and uh you know and 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 white is fine but what did black do in this position and hopefully you can see how this dovetails in with uh, the move my opponent had. So what should black do here? Well, knight takes d7. Yeah, knight takes d7 and white resigned. Because the bishop is hanging. So if you take on g2, you lose the bishop. And if you take the queen or if you do anything else, white takes the rook and promotes to a queen. Why does the black is a queen up? Black is a rook up. So just remember this concept. I mean, this is how you learn about these types of patterns, right? You just keep adding to your, your arsenal of ideas and eventually you just start seeing the stuff at the board. So this is how I was able to find this move. This is how I saw it. I just know this trick. Um, so here it's not the same, but because after bishop takes e7, c takes d4, we've already taken one of black's pieces. So material is going to be equal. Now, if he takes on d8, then we take on d4, we're up a pawn. What I was calculating is d takes c3. How do you evaluate this position? Well, it's not that hard to evaluate. After the bishop drops back, okay, you could trade b2. Why does a slightly damaged pawn structure on the queen side? But look at the d6 pawn. It can't be defended. We're going to take it on the next move, and we're going to be dominating in the end game. Thank you, Shai Cry. Does that make sense? Uh, one more thing. If black goes knight c5, trying to counterattack e4... Who can tell me, should white take on d6 here? Yes or no? Or should white play a move like f3 and reinforce the pawn first? Yes, very good. You should take on, on d6 because here you have the move rookie one. And then you follow up with f3 and the knight is toast. Very good. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Our opponent probably didn't see that. He plays queen takes d7, queen c4. And already after e5, things are terrible. I just wanted to make one comment after knight e8, which is that, um, well, in such positions, it can be a good idea to keep the tension. 
What does it mean to keep the tension? It means to create a situation where we are essentially trying to get our opponents to be the one to trade bishops. So we want to do something such that if black takes our bishop, uh, it would result in a major concession. What move am I implying here? What move would be possible? This is a classic sort of GM move, h4, yeah. h4 was a very interesting move. And it is true that black can play h6 and essentially force us to take. But then one could argue that we've made the move h4, which is beneficial to us, and h6 is a hook. But the point is that if bishop takes g5, h takes g5 happens, well, this is really unthinkable for black, because now the h-file opens, and black can't tolerate something like that together with the weakness of his center. So, you know... Just a possibility, but we decided to play it simple. Now rook h e one, getting our, getting all the all the toys to the nursery party. Knight d five, and just an important note: knight e seven check, as I explained during the game. Queen takes e seven. Don't miss these kinds of moves. Remember that when your queen is hanging, the rules of engagement are different, and and your opponent can give his or her queen uh, at any moment if your queen is hanging. So be very careful about that, and so that's why. You should treat these situations with a lot of caution. Queen a3. And I wanted to make one more detour uh, in order to explain, you know, this notion of using the queen as a supporting actress, as, as a kind of war general. Another way to think about it is using the queen as a kind of war general, directing things from behind rather than sort of, uh, rather than being in the middle of everything. Sometimes the queen is too valuable to be in the middle of everything. And sometimes... The queen is just not as effective as other pieces at uh, at close quarter combat, which should make sense to you because the queen is a long range piece, just like the bishop. And I have a very good example of this from one of my games. I was very proud of finding this this idea in one of my games. It's one of my first wins against the twenty six hundred plus rated GM. So this is from a tournament in twenty twelve. I was an IM at the time. I narrowly missed a norm in this tournament. My opponent is a twenty six hundred GM. So this is not the like main position yet. It's just that in this position, I made a really nutty move that I want to share with you. I, this is like a classic narrative scheme move. So clearly, white has this big attack going, right? I mean, white has this pawn on f6. And I was thinking about how to attack g7. So I decided to play, <laughs> I play the move rook d7 here, um, which is not the best move objectively, but practically it's, it's really cute. Uh, and as you can see, the idea is rook takes d7, queen g4. And I pick up the rook because of the mate threat against g7. And not only do I pick up the rook, but I do so with interest. Because the queen on d7 is, is really, really strong. And my opponent drops his queen back to b6. I go bishop d5. And now queen c7, very strong move. And now the first nice queen maneuver. The first example of using the queen and not being afraid to make retreating moves. What did I do in this position? Because clearly a queen trade is out of the question, then the attack evaporates. Yeah, queen h3, very good. Queen h3, knight d8, and queen h6. By the way, not being afraid of queen takes c2 check, that doesn't do anything. After king a1, white is winning. Knight e6 is the only move, and now bishop takes e6. So my opponent goes with the immediate knight e6, bishop takes e6, f takes e6, and the point is that he keeps... The queen on c7 where it guards g7. So there's no checkmate. Okay, go rook f1. This threatens the move f7. And the critical position occurs after queen f7. This is the most important position in the whole game. Because this is where I found the game-winning move. Now, it may seem, logically speaking, that the queen on h6 is white's strongest piece. That may seem like the case visually because it looks like okay well it ties down black's queen it creates this idea of queen g7 but that, but that's an illusion that's an illusion what's actually tying down black's queen is not white's queen it's the combination of white's rook and white's pawn if that makes sense because at the moment the black's queen moves away there's going to be f7 check with decisive effect right so you might think about it in a different way and say okay white's queen is actually not needed on h6 at the moment it has to go elsewhere. Well, where can it go? Well, another thing that you might notice here is that the knight on b3 is not participating in the attack, and that cannot stand, because white just doesn't have enough pieces to afford one of the pieces being unemployed. How do you activate the knight? Well, wouldn't it be great if you could go knight c5 and then knight d3 and knight takes c5? Well, you can't because of the rook. And so I played the move queen e3. Queen e3 is just very, very strong. 
H6. H6 is a tricky move. He wants my queen to go back. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not biting. Knight C5. Knight D3. Knight E5. Chasing the queen away. And now Knight G4. Crushing. He takes C2. That's a meaningless check. And after G5, Queen H3 black resigned because he cannot stop. This time, the queen infiltrates to H6, but now it's going to be checkmate. So I think this is a good example of, of what I'm talking about. And the knight ends up winning the game. Um, yeah, it was a nice finale. And that's uh, that's all she wrote. Now, transitioning back to the game. Yeah, I mean, g6, ends, g6 obviously finishes everything early, but um, rook a d8, rook e d1, black's position is terrible, down a pawn and under tremendous pressure. There was one more thing I wanted to show, which is uh, what would happen after rook a to c8. So here, things are a little bit more complicated. You can go knight e7 check. But after queen takes e7, who can crack my idea? What should white do here? And this is a very tricky question because I can totally see a move here that might be tempting to some people, but it doesn't work actually for multiple reasons. Yes, you guys are all falling for it. I feel empowered. Queen takes e8 is wrong for two reasons. The first, you forgot to check no pun intended. You forgot to check whether black's queen can move away with check. That's what you have to do. And it can. It can go queen g5 check and you're toast because now white's queen is lost. The second thing black can do is actually just play knight back takes c8. Rook takes c7. Nope, not that. Rook takes d1 and then knight takes c7 and black is up a piece. So in reality, I faked you out. The solution is a lot simpler. You just play rook takes c7. Rook takes c5, and now very importantly, rook takes d6. Uh, black is unable to take, and since black is unable to take, white is winning in the endgame. You've just got hugely active rooks, and you're just going to start vacuuming up all of black spawns. You might even double on the 7th rank. So that was the idea that I had. Just uh, slightly complex tactics, but nothing crazy. Um, and that's, that's about it. Yeah, g6, knight f6 ends the game. And we're over 1,500, making progress. But you can see that these games are starting to become a little bit more two-sided. And hopefully, you know, we can do sort of more interesting middle game work since we're not always going to be getting out of the opening in a winning position. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Lovely stream today, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.